So let's begin by standing together, reading from Psalm 95, our call to worship. Words will be on the screen. Let's say this aloud together. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, and the sheep of His hand. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. And this is a seminar about singing, so we're going to sing together. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. And streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. And teach me some melodious sonnet, Sung by flaming tongues above, praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Let us continue in prayer. Why don't you pray with me? God, we ask that you would tune our hearts by the, uh, the pitchfork of your word sung by your Holy Spirit. Help us to sing thy grace today. We ask for your help. In the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. 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 You can be seated. Well, again, thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time on a Saturday to come out to discuss worship and worship through song and singing. The goal of today is simple. We're not leaving here until we are all master vocalists. Until we are... (laughs) It's going to be a long day. We said, we said nine to noon just to get you here, but just, yeah, hunker down. No, the goal, is, the goal today is not for everyone to leave with excellent vocal abilities or a finely tuned singing machine. Um, this isn't even for the trained singer, the professional musicians among us only. The goal is to stir up, stir up love and good works, love for each other, love for God, and that we would take up the good work of worship and singing. So we're going to start off this morning with, um, with Ryan. Ryan's going to uh, start our morning off talking about the theology of worship. You have your notes with you. You can follow along, take notes. And also, if you would, write down questions that you might have throughout the first um, two, two and a half sessions. And, and in the middle of session three, we'll have a Q&A. Um, So you guys can ask questions, and we would love to try to address any of those questions that you might have. But um, so as we uh, as we start our morning off, Ryan, you can come and uh, and lead us in studying and thinking about the theology of worship. Ryan Kelly, everyone. Drew Hodge, everybody. This was Drew's idea, and I think it's a good idea. And uh, I'm glad to do it with them. Uh, Let me start out with a a clarification, or maybe a distinction. This seminar is primarily on singing, and singing is part of corporate worship. But those two are not exactly the same thing, singing and worship. Not all singing is worship, of course. And worship is certainly certainly not limited to singing. Uh, When we do corporate worship, singing is one component of that. Uh, And I'm sure throughout this morning, there'll be a couple of times at least, where Drew and I say worship and we mean singing. Hopefully context will be clear. It'll be a mistake if we do that. Uh, We'll try to make that distinction and uh, not talk about singing as worship uh, with just that word worship. But but know as we get into this, the theology of worship, um, know that we're going to get into specifics about singing in worship in session two and three. But my task in session one is to start us off uh, 
more broadly on a theology of worship. So I'm going to try to work through four P's related to a theology of worship. Much more could be said about a theology of worship. In fact, it's daunting to think of unpacking a theology of worship in 50 minutes or so, uh, but that's what we've got planned. Uh, So here are the four P's. God's plan for worship, God's presence in worship, some principles for worship, and then the parts of worship or the things that we do in worship. Let me start out, though, with a definition of worship. I I thought maybe we should take time to sort of brainstorm together and uh, hear some thoughts on what worship is or how you define it. And uh, I thought, well, that's going to eat up five minutes. And uh, anyway, let me get into a definition of worship from D.A. Carson. Here's what Carson says worship is. And let me qualify this before I read this long definition. Uh, Mark Dever, who's friends with D.A. Carson, calls Don Carson the great complexifier. (laughs) He's one of those smart guys, you ask a simple question, you think it's a simple answer, and he says, well, that depends. I mean, if you look at it this way, and then if you look at it that way, and don't tell him I did that (laughs) imitation when he comes here in a couple weeks. All right, here's what he says about worship being defined. Worship is the proper response of all moral, sentient beings to God, ascribing all honor and worth to their creator, precisely because he is worthy, delightfully so. This side of the fall, human worship of God properly responds to the redemptive provisions that God has graciously made. While all true worship is God-centered, Christian worship is no less Christ-centered. Empowered by the Spirit and in line with the stipulations of the new covenant, it manifests itself in all our living, finding its impulses in the gospel, which restores our relationship with our Redeemer God, and therefore also with our fellow image bearers, our co-worshippers. Such worship therefore manifests itself in adoration and in action, in individual believers and in corporate worship which is worship offered up in the context of the body of believers who strive to align the forms of their devout ascription of all worth to God with the panoply of new covenant mandates. I know, panoply, right? (laughs) Of new covenant mandates and examples that bring to fulfillment the glories of antecedent revelation, that's the Old Testament, and anticipate the consummation. Whew. That's a long definition. He admits it. He admits it's a ridiculously long definition. And in the following pages, he unpacks that about a sentence at a time, uh, explaining each one with a paragraph or two. I read that for you to let you know this is a complex issue. Uh, We have a a complex God. We have a big Bible. Uh, This is something big and something we should give careful thought to. Perhaps none of us will ever get to this kind of careful thought in our defining of of God's worship, but uh, anyway, that lets us know that this is serious business, this theology of worship or what worship is. It's bigger than you might think. So down in your notes, let's begin with this first Roman numeral, God's plan for worship. What's his plan? Or really, what's the Bible's story as it relates to worship? It goes like this. Number one, worship was created. Genesis 1 and 2. On the one hand, you could say worship has always been. God has always been worshiping himself. The triune God has been in communion and worship throughout all the ages. And and angels have worshiped uh, the the Trinity, the triune God, before before people ever did. But in some ways, Genesis 1 to 2 is is creating a people for God's glory and, and for his worship. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, first question, asks, what is man's primary purpose? What is it? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. So that's worship. That's what we were made to do. Worship created. Secondly, there's worship lost in the Bible story, Genesis 3. Now, why would I say that in Genesis 3, at the fall, that that worship was lost? Well, in some ways it was. I mean, you think about it, they, were, they fled from God's presence. They were cast out of the garden. You turn the page to Genesis 4, and there's this, this description of civilizations growing. 
and they're growing in industry and creativity and skill and invention, and there's no mention of God. Read Genesis 4 when you get a chance. There's no mention of God, despite all their busyness and creativity and growth. So worship was lost. But then, thirdly, worship begins to be restored. Worship is being restored in the following chapters. Really, in your notes, you see there Genesis 4 to 50. Uh, It's probably better to say Genesis 5 to 50, since I just said Genesis 4 is a good example of, of when worship was lost and men were sort of on their own uh, aiming, aimless and in, in roaming about. But worship begins to be restored in Genesis 4 through promise. Promise to Noah, then a little bit later, promise to Abraham. You get promises all through Genesis, the, the, the rest of Genesis. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. God is restoring his worship in part through one family and grand promises to that one family. Then you get to Moses, and God is restoring his worship there through not just one family, but through many people. And he's doing it through forms. Forms like the tabernacle, the ark of the covenant, the priesthood, the law, ceremonial laws. He's establishing and reestablishing, rather, his worship through those forms Then when you get to David, one way of describing that era of kings is that God's worship is being restored through models. It's not the only way to describe that era of the kings. Of course, there's a a rule, and that's really important. You know, when there's no king in the land, people do what's right in their own eyes. And so David's a solution for that. But he's also a great model for us with this massive output of psalms that are so... Uh, so useful for corporate and private worship. In a bonus one you can add to your notes under this point is God uh, reestablishing his worship through promise of still more to come. And that's through the prophets. So you think after the time of David, there's the prophets. And what are they talking about? Well, sometimes they're talking about exile and judgment. And sometimes they're talking about promise and hope to come. And it's It's far grander than any kind of going back to the good old days. There's promise of more still to come. But then fourthly, worship is restored. It's not being restored, but it is restored in Christ and to his church. A key text on this is John 4. So if you turn in your Bibles to John 4, hopefully you brought a Bible with you today. Let's look at John 4. This is Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well. She asks him some great questions, which leads to Jesus talking about that transition from Old Covenant to New Covenant, from Old Testament to New Testament, that restoration of worship that was promised in the prophets is now here. It's happening. So let me read, starting in verse 19. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem you will worship the Father. You will worship, you worship, you Samaritans, what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews." But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In other words, God's worship as it moves across the divide of old covenant into new covenant is now delocalized. In fact, let me write these on the board for us. I think these come from John Piper. I've been using them so long, I don't remember exactly where I got them, but I I think it is Piper who talks about God's worship from Old Covenant to New Covenant is delocalized in that it used to be in Jerusalem, on that mountain, in a tabernacle or in a temple. And now it's everywhere. It's in human hearts. 
We are his temple. It's delocalized. It's deinstitutionalized. It doesn't have the same, well, I'll just give you a new word while we're at it. It doesn't have the same form, so it's deformalized. That doesn't mean that God's worship now can't be formal in its aesthetics, but it doesn't have the same Old Testament forms that it used to have. It's also then de-externalized. Oh, uh, there we go. De-externalized. That means it's not about externals merely. In the Old Covenant, it wasn't just about externals, but there was a lot of externals to it. The Hebrew word for worship is really to bow. It was a physical thing. It was something you did. It was some, some movement you made. You burned this thing. You went over there. It had forms, and it was external. And now, God's worship in the new covenant is internalized and intensified. Okay? That's what's going on in John 4. Jesus says, it's not that mountain or this mountain. It was this mountain. We had the right mountain. You had the wrong mountain. But it's not about mountains anymore. It's not about place. It's not about form. It's spirit and in truth, and that is the only true worship. That's the era in which we live, the new covenant era. And lastly, worship, fifth, is consummated in a new creation. Revelation 21. 22, talk about this new creation, a new heaven and a new earth, and worship is central to it. Communion with God is central to it. His glory fills that place like the sun. So we're not there yet, which tells us that God is not done yet. And there's a comforting explanation in that for why we for why our corporate worship can sometimes feel like it is a mingling of heaven and earth. We almost are caught up to the third heaven. Yet sometimes our corporate worship can feel like a whole lot of nothing. And most of the time, our corporate worship feels like something in between those two extremes. Something in between being caught up to heaven, a mingling of heaven and earth, and a whole lot of nothing. We have an explanation for that. It's now and it's not yet. The, the worship of the Father has come in spirit and in truth, genuinely and truly, and yet we're not home yet. We don't now see him, but one day we will. We still battle sin, and so we battle distraction on Sunday mornings, and we, we have mixed emotions at times, and there's relational tensions in the midst of our church, even while we're in the midst of worship. But, what, but one day all those will be removed, and one day we will worship him as we were made to do and in ways that we can't now imagine. And that's why heaven is described in such almost magical, mysterious terms, symbolic terms. You know, it's not that the gold streets are really going to be gold, and we're, you know, that's how rich we all are. We can put gold on the streets. But it's that, what do you do with this stuff that we used to think is precious? I don't know, use it for utilitarian purposes. Put it in the street. Because he's the glory, he's the gold. Uh, it's symbolic, I think, but not to remove any of the glory of heaven. It's symbolic to show us the unthinkable, unestimable glory of heaven. All right, Roman numeral two, the second P, God's presence in worship. I'm going to run through this section quickly since it overlaps so much with the first section regarding the plan of worship. But whenever we think of the progressive plan of God's worship and that worship being restored, we can never forget how central his presence is to that whole story. God's presence in corporate worship goes like this. Three things to say about it. First, the whole plan of God and really the whole Bible can be charted along the axis of God's presence. You can think about the ups and downs of his plan, where he's moving it along in terms of where he is with his people. 
where he is in proximity to his people. So again, just look back at that list, that, those five points that I had before on the plan. Think about how you could just think of God's presence along those same lines. Presence enjoyed in the garden. Presence lost in Genesis 3. Presence being restored, but at first just with individuals. Where God talks to Noah, or God talks to Abraham, or God talks to Isaac. And then eventually it's restored or being restored among a people. At first, not up close. It's the fire, it's the cloud, it's far away. You can't hear that or you'll die. But then it's within the camp. Then God says, build me a tabernacle. I'll dwell with you in the midst of you. He's drawing near to his people. But it's a, it's a temporary thing. It's a tent. The tabernacle is meant to be mobile. So you get to the promised land, a place for God and his people. And, and it makes sense that David would say, how about I build you a home? You built me a household. How about I build you a home? And God says, not yet. We'll do it a generation later. But, uh, but that's nice of you. I'll, instead, I'm going to build you a household, a lineage. But a temple does eventually appear, and it's great and glorious. But then his presence is lost again, in a sense, when his people are exiled. In judgment, God sends them away from the place of his presence. And the temple itself, which was destroyed, he puts them in a time out for 70 years. Yes, guys like Daniel can pray to him. He's still with them in that sense. But there's something of a difference between his presence in Jerusalem in that era and his presence uh, among his people when they're, say, in Babylon. So he brings them back to the land, but his presence never really comes back. He never re-enters the temple like he did the first time. They're saying, when's he going to come? And then he comes. He comes in Christ, right? He came and we beheld his glory. Right? He tabernacled among us. He templed among us. And now the Holy Spirit lives within our hearts. We are his temple. And one day he will bring us to himself. The whole plan of God can be charted along the axis of God's presence. Secondly, his presence is everywhere and his worship is in everything. This has always been true, whether it's the old covenant or the new but it is a truth and reality that is somewhat scarce in the Old Testament and, and pretty plentiful in the New Testament. So we think of 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God, even mundane, simple things. Or Romans 12, that we're laying our lives down as living sacrifices, daily sacrifices, everything is worship. His presence is everywhere, and his worship is everything. But thirdly, his presence is intensified and prioritized in corporate worship. It's not enough to just say, God is everywhere, so let's just worship him everywhere and anywhere, and that's it, period and end of story. No, his presence is intensified and prioritized in corporate worship. We can pursue his presence privately, and we should. We should pursue his presence familially as families, and we should. And we should also do it congregationally. There's sort of a unique intensity to corporate worship, and hence a priority for corporate worship. One Puritan wrote a whole book on why corporate worship is to be preferred over private worship. Have you thought about that? If you had to give up devotions, or Sunday morning corporate worship. Thankfully, you don't have to give one of them up. You should do both as much as you can. But if you had to give one of them up, which one would you give up? I think probably in our American evangelical culture today, we'd, we'd say, oh, devotions, devotions. Yeah, that's where it's at. Or maybe you'd say, well, it should be devotions, but I'm not very good at it. But the Puritans would say, and I think they're right, no, there seems to be a priority when God's people assemble that God is there in their midst and something big is happening. Just think of the fact that almost all of the New Testament prescriptions and descriptions for worship are written not to individuals, but to churches. And they're addressed in the plural. You all do this. Not you individually do this, but you all do these things. Hebrews 10 and Hebrews 12 are good examples of that. 
Paul's instruction on worship in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 is another example of that. And maybe the best is 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2, 5 says, Like living stones, you are being built up into a spiritual house. I've talked about this verse many times, so I won't take too much time on it. But the picture is the temple and the stones that made up the temple. And Peter is saying, each of you is like one of the stones. And what do those stones do? Well, they go together. What do bricks do? They go together. It's what they were made to do. They form a house by being put together. And you are being formed together to make up a temple for the presence of God and for sacrifices to him. All right, that's God's presence. Now, thirdly, third Roman numeral. Some principles for worship. Some principles. These are historic and or scriptural principles. Many of them could be suggested here, many principles, but I'll limit it to four principles. Principles which guide how we think about corporate worship and what we do in corporate worship. Here's the first principle. Revelation and response. That means that God initiates and we respond. It doesn't start with us. It starts with him. He reveals, and based on that revelation, we respond. A classic passage for this is Psalm 145, verse 3. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable, it says. So we've got to think about each of those separately and together. Great is the Lord. That's revelation. Greatly to be praised. That's response. Now, what does it mean when we say great is the Lord and when we acknowledge that his greatness is unsearchable? And what does it mean that our response, he's greatly to be praised, is built upon the revelation of his greatness? It starts with him. It starts with his greatness. Let me quote D.A. Carson again. I think this is helpful. And it's easier to understand than his rather thick definition of worship. He says, excellent worship cannot be attained merely by pursuing excellent worship. You cannot find excellent corporate worship until you stop trying to find excellent corporate worship and pursue God himself. One sometimes wonders if we are beginning to worship worship rather than worship God. As a brother put it to me recently, it's a bit like those who begin by admiring the sunset and soon begin to admire themselves admiring the sunset. Take a praise chorus like, let's forget about ourselves and magnify the Lord and worship him. The trouble is that after you have sung this repetitious chorus three or four times, you're no farther ahead. The way you forget about yourself is by focusing on God, not by singing about doing it, but by doing it. And on and on he goes. Very, very helpful. He says, if you wish to deepen the worship of the people of God, above all, deepen their grasp of, of his ineffable majesty in his person and in all his works. If you want to deepen worship, deepen the people's grasp of God in all his majesty. That's what we mean by great is the Lord. We want to sing songs that are thick. We want to sing songs that teach. We want to talk about him and think about him in not merely shallow and simple ways. Of course, we can gaze upon the, the simple and wonderful and easily grasped truths left and right, but we should also realize that his greatness is unsearchable. And that shouldn't be cause for us to give up searching. If his greatness is unsearchable, we should want to plumb as much of the depths as we can. And in response to whatever we plumb, the response, greatly to be praised. Greatly to be praised. What does that mean? It could relate to skill. If he's great, he should be praised greatly with great skill. I think there's something to that. The psalmists talk about that. Do it with great skill. 
great depth. That could be part of it. He's great and he's to be, prayed, to be praised greatly, deeply, thoughtfully, thoroughly. Great emotion. If he's great and his, uh, his greatness is unsearchable, then, then we should praise him greatly from the heart, from the innermost of our being. Great volume, I think, probably has something to do with this, or at times great silence. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Sometimes that means shut up and be still and know that I am God. And other times that means great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. We can't keep it in and we can't keep quiet. Great breadth. By that I mean number of people. Great is the Lord. And yes, he's in the midst when two or three are gathered. But there is something about calling on the congregation to worship him and even calling on the nations in all the world to worship him. God will be one day worshipped from a multitude, uh, by a multitude from every tongue and nation, and kindred and, and, and nation. And it'll be a multitude which no man can number. There's something about the the growing number, the swell of people that reflects the greatness of our God and the, the greatness of his praise. We could even think about how greatly to be praised reflects, is reflected in the diversity of our descriptions of him. We're not one-note Charlies. We're not just saying he's love. We're saying he is also severe. We're saying he is holy, holy, holy. We want to think on, reflect on, and respond to the diversity of his, of his attributes. So revelation and response, great is the Lord and greatly to be, to be praised. There's a proper order there. And yes, commensurate greatness in our praise will never be achieved. We're never going to praise him as great as he is great. But there should be some correlation and we should be eager for more Great praise because he is great. Second principle is spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. Back to John 4. Remember, that's what Jesus said true worship is. It's not on that mountain. It's not about going there and making this sacrifice or that sacrifice. But because God is spirit, those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. There's some debate as to what that means, spirit and in truth. There's some debate as to whether that, that spirit should be capitalized, capital S or not. I tend to think that this is just simply head and heart, spirit and in truth, heart and head. But I think it's in the, that proper order of head, then heart. So let me embarrass myself by trying to draw this. Uh, I'll have to erase some here. <coughs> Hopefully you can draw this better on your page than I can up here on the board. Here's a person. He has arms. He has a heart. A little Justin Bieber heart there. And, uh, and truth comes in. Right? This is truth sung. Right? Or read. It goes into this brain. I don't know how to draw a brain. Something like that. And right here, it is chewed. It is... It's chewed like teeth, like mandibles. And, and then that truth is digested, actually not in the stomach. I guess you could in another culture. They'd say that the stomach's the place of the affections and feeling. But, but heart is another one or spirit. And right here, the, this, digest, or this, uh, this chewed truth is digested in the heart. I know it's a mixed metaphor, right? Because you digest in the stomach. But, but here we digest in the heart. It's churned again. And there develops a, a holy heartburn, okay? And from that holy heartburn, it seeks escape. I know, here's where it gets gross, right? <laughs> the holy heartburn seeks escape. And, and about this time, you want to take Pepto-Bismol or some Tums or something. Um, but, but again, bear with me. We're mixing metaphors all over the place here. And... It's not actual gas from the stomach, from the digestion. We're, we're talking about a holy heartburn that mysteriously produces, well, song, right? 
physical expression. Hands raised. That's a big hand. (laughs) Do you get it? There's the progression that we should be thinking about. So as we're singing, truth is chewed in the brain. We're not just singing these things because, well, we should, or because we like the song, or because it's familiar, or, or because we like the chorus, but we don't think much during the sort of wordy verses. No, no, we're chewing truth. We're meditating on what we're singing, at our best anyway. But it doesn't stop there. This is not an intellectual exercise. We're not reminding ourselves of theological doctrines or truths or passages and stopping there, but we're, we're cramming it down into our hearts. We're swallowing and there it, it does another work, hopefully. Uh, and it's churned, holy heartburn. And that holy heartburn seeks escape. You might be thinking at this point, well, if that's what worship is, then I think I've done it probably twice or three times. So what, what do we do when, when that feels impossible, out of our reach, Well, we glorify God three different ways. I'll write these down for you. We glorify God in the lofty exaltation that I just described here, okay? That's ideal. Man, it's great when that happens. We also glorify God on more realistic days by longing for lofty exaltation, and then hence, praying for his help. There's even a lower rung on the ladder. When you don't long for it, you can glorify God by repenting for not longing. And hence, praying for his help. That makes it more realistic, doesn't it? We want this. We pray for this. We acknowledge the fact that sometimes we're not there. Many times we're not there. So we long for it. We pray for it. And sometimes we don't even long for it. And we feel bad about it. And we talk to God about it. That's called repentance. And we repent for not longing and again praying for his help. The key, I think, though, or the goal, we should say, is affections. I think the key ingredient is affections. Piper puts it like this. Praising is prizing. I like that. Praising is prizing. That's not the only thing. It's not just a warm feeling in the heart. It's not just feeling warm and happy. Yes, it starts with truth. And yes, it it ends hopefully with song and harmony and, 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 you know, hands raised. But the thing in the middle, the thing that makes worship different from just meditation or just singing is affection. Here's what Jonathan Edwards said about this. He said, God is glorified in communicating himself to our hearts. Communicating himself to our hearts. You get that? Not apart from our brains, but into our hearts. And he's glorified in his people rejoicing and delighting in and enjoying the manifestations which he makes of himself or the truth he communicates about himself. God is glorified not only by his glory being seen, but by it being rejoiced in. When those that see it delight in it, God is more glorified than if they only see it. His glory is then received by the whole soul, both by the understanding and the heart. He later said, as a pastor, as a preacher, I think it's my duty to raise the affections of my hearers as highly as I possibly can, provided that they are affected by nothing but truth. You hear that? So he says, the goal of my preaching, I think it translates to corporate worship and singing as well. The goal is raising our affections for God. But we don't want to do that simply through, well, the acapella part where the instruments drop out or the lights 
you know, doing something special, a going dark or smoke coming out just then, uh, or by the impressiveness of the massive drum solo in the middle, or, you know, the, the, the guitar solo that brings you to tears. No, he said, I, I want them to be affected, and I want them to raise their affections, but I don't want it to happen apart from truth. I want it to be nothing but truth. All right, that's spirit and truth. Thirdly, let's talk about receiving and giving. This is important. Is worship giving to God? Well, yes, it is. The Psalms talk about this, like Psalm 66. Give to him glorious praise. The word give is in the Psalms in relation to worship to God. But it's really important for us to think that to to know that we're not giving to God in a way where he needs what we give him, nor is improved by what we give him. In fact, we are the needy ones, and predominantly in worship, we come to him to get from him, not to give to him. We receive. Listen to Psalm 50, God speaking there. He says, I will not take a bull from your house or goats from your folds, For every beast of the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills is mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. I'm not lacking anything. I don't need something from you. I don't come to you with requests. For the world and all that's in it is mine. Instead, he says, call upon me in the day of trouble. You call on me and I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. I'm not needy. You are. And I'm glorified when you call on me and I answer and help. Or think of Psalm 116, where David said, What shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits to me? Think about that. What do I render to him or give back to him for all that he's done? For all his benefits? What could you possibly give God in return for all of his benefits? What's David going to say next? I will lift up the cup of salvation in the name of the Lord. A cup that needs to be filled, a cup that God fills, a cup that, I mean, not a cup of salvation that we've designed or beautified or we bought for him. It's the cup of salvation. You lift that up to him saying, here, fill it again. I'm desperate, I'm needy. The fourth principle is the regulative principle. Here's a definition That might be clumsy for you at first, but don't worry, it's not long. The regulative principle is this. In worship, we do what God commanded us to do, not anything that he hasn't forbidden. Did you get that? In worship, we do what God commanded us to do, not whatever he hasn't forbidden. There's some things he's forbidden, but there are a lot of things that he's prescribed and told us what to do. The regulative principle. There's been debate in the Reformation tradition about how this principle should be applied. So one extreme application of this would be uh, no instruments, because no instruments are mentioned in the New Testament. Or psalms only, because that's the only place where you got songs in the Bible, and so you sing Bible songs, not made-up songs. We don't agree with those. But there has been a general agreement in the Reformation tradition that the basic ingredients in our corporate worship are the things that God has taught us to do, told us to do, not whatever we can invent and create that might seem neat or draw crowds. Some examples of this would show the the seriousness of it. One would be Nadab and Abihu, In Numbers chapter 3, the sons of Aaron, it just says they offered strange fire before the Lord, some sort of sacrifice that was strange or unapproved, and they were consumed by fire right then. They didn't worship God as he prescribed. Maybe they were the creative type. Maybe they thought, well, he said do it this way, but what if we did it this way and this way? Well, whatever their thinking was, they didn't do what God prescribed, they were killed. Uzzah, in 2 Samuel 6, 
He was the guy who touched the ark because it was, it was teetering. He touched the ark. God said not to touch the ark. He was killed. 1 Samuel 6, 80 men looked upon the ark and were killed. That probably means that they looked in it, which God said not to do. And they were killed. Related to the regulative principle, we need to talk about what God has commanded us to do, especially now in the New Covenant. So here are the parts of worship, our last section. The parts of worship, or the ingredients of worship, or what God has told us to do, and hence what we do. Number one, God speaks through his word read and preached. These really could be separate things, scripture reading and scripture preaching. 1 Timothy 4.13, there Paul told Timothy, Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Public reading of Scripture. I don't think it's enough for us just to, just to, mm, I don't know, talk about Scripture. We should have times in our service together where we hear from God, where we either read the passage that we're going to look at in the sermon time or other passages as well. Reading of Scripture, also the preaching of Scripture. 1 Timothy 4, there Paul says to Timothy, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. So the word read, the word preach. Secondly, God communicates through sacraments or ordinances. We have two in the New Covenant, the Lord's Supper and Baptism. These don't speak or communicate so clearly to us that we ever do the bare sacrament. That's what it's historically called. The sacrament by itself, it's always accompanied with the preaching of God's word. Because the preached word is very clear, and then the sacrament is a symbol. By nature, a symbol is, well, it's a good illustration. It's not, it's not the same thing as, as speech. Um, and so, yes, preaching goes along with the sacraments or the ordinances, but God does communicate in the sacraments his goodness, his presence, his promises. These are uniquely visual and symbolic acts that we do. Acts 2.42 says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Have you ever thought about devoting yourselves to the Lord's Supper? There it is. There's a passage for it. God communicates, communicates through sacraments. That's why we do it. You, you could say, well, baptism seems outdated. Lord's Supper, what a weird thing he's given us. We get together, we eat a small piece of bread, we drink a very small cup of juice, we talk and sing, we go home. That seems silly. Yeah, I wouldn't have come up with it myself, but Jesus did. And he says that we should do it and devote ourselves to it and that he'll bless it. Thirdly, we commune with him in prayer when we worship. These are the parts of worship. We pray. Remember, Acts 2.42 says they devoted themselves to teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and to prayer. You think of 1 Timothy 2. You might want to write down this reference. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4, gives a rather long instruction on prayer. And I think in the context, it's corporate prayer. Since the whole book of 1 Timothy was written, that you might know how to conduct yourselves in the household of God, the church. Fourth, we respond with giving and fellowship. Giving is talked about in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. It's what Paul called your partnership in the gospel in Philippians 1. That's really a response to what God has done, a response to needs in the body, a response to his work. Here and abroad, fellowship is in many ways a reality and also a response. I mean, it's something we do, yes, before we meet together, but, but also after. We, we, we sort of have just experienced God's presence in his truth and his worship in a unique way, in a special way. And after that, we, we share something we didn't share before. We, we share a worship moment that we didn't share before. Fellowship's part of responding to worship and to oh, what we do when we meet together. And lastly, singing. 
singing is not only commanded in the New Testament, but it is remarkably multidimensional. By that I mean, think about these things we were just talking about, about these parts of worship, right? In the word preach, we're hearing from God. In the sacraments, he communicates to us. In prayer, we communicate with him. In fellowship, we respond to him and his truth. In giving to him, we respond to what he's done and what he's called us to do. Prayer is remarkably multidimensional in that we're asking for his help. We're giving praise to him in prayer, giving thanks. We're doing it together. It's an expression of fellowship, even if there's just one person leading it, and we're all praying together with heads bowed quietly. It's still a shared moment. It's fellowship. Singing is not only commanded in the New Testament, but it is remarkably multidimensional. We are doing it not just to God, we're also doing it to each other. We sing to each other. Two key passages, even if you don't turn in your Bibles, just write down these references and I'll read the verses for us. Colossians 3.16 and Ephesians 5.19. The two classic singing passages of the New Testament. Colossians 3.16 says... Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, and here's how, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So notice the one another dimension to singing. You're doing this to each other and with one another. Notice the teaching dimension to our singing. Our singing to one another, whether it's psalms and hymns or spiritual songs, we are teaching and admonishing one another in our songs. Which means our songs should have something to teach. If you say, we sing songs that are very different than what I hear on the radio, I would say, yeah, we're trying to do something different. right? We're trying to take this thing, song and melody, and teach each other with it, remind each other with it. We've got purposes that are not just, you know, we're not just here to swoon or entertain. We're here to teach and instruct and remind, to admonish. And then as I read on in Colossians 3.16, let me point out, it says teaching and admonishing one another. That's horizontal. But then it says with thankfulness in your hearts to God. It's always good, by the way, to know what kind of song we're dealing with. I know Drew is going to talk about this, but I can't, I can't not point it out here. Uh, it's always important for us to know what kind of song we're dealing with as we're singing a song. Is this vertical? Is it a prayer? Is it praise? Is it about God? Is it to me? Is it a resolve? Is it to others? If it is to others, why not glance around a little bit more than you do? We've got a worship center that's pretty conducive to that. If you ever see me do this, it's not because I'm looking to see if so-and-so's here or who came in late or something like that. I, I'm doing this because we're doing something corporate and I just got to look and see. I, I got to look and see what uh, others are doing. And I got to sing to someone because that's what I'm doing right now. Uh, here's Ephesians 5, 19, basically communicating the same truths. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Again, one another and to the Lord and with the heart. So what do we do in corporate worship? We do what God has commanded us to do, not anything that we can invent that he hasn't forbidden. We do scripture, we do sacraments, we pray, we respond with giving and fellowship, and we sing. We're not going to do interpretive dancing. We're not going to have stations where people can go and paint something while the rest of us sing or listen to a sermon. We're not going to do feats of strength in the name of 1 Corinthians 10.31 or Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. We're not going to watch a movie together in place of other things. We're going to do what God has commanded us to do because we believe that he will bless what he said he would bless. Even if it looks like it's less sophisticated than another model or different ingredients, even if we look less cool than another church or another 
way of doing church, even if it draws less people, we're gonna trust that God will bless what he said to do when it's done according to his word and for his glory. Now, one more thing to point out. That means that there is a whole lot that God hasn't prescribed for our corporate worship. There is a lot of freedom in the forms and order and style of of us doing those God-prescribed things that I just mentioned, those five things. That doesn't mean that we reinvent the wheel every Sunday. It doesn't mean that we aim to be overly creative. We want to maintain a kind of biblical simplicity about what we do that depends upon God and not, not ourselves. We want to lean on and borrow from the history of the church, not pretend we're detached from it. But we also want to acknowledge the fact that there isn't some sort of unbroken chain with a very specific liturgy that traces back through the Reformation to the apostles, and it's never changed since. God's word is actually remarkably unspecific about what we're exactly to do when we meet together. And it's unspecific in large part because worship is in spirit and in truth, and because his worship is to be spread abroad in the world among nations and cultures and peoples and different times. So I close with this, a quote from John Calvin, which makes him sound rather radical and revolutionary. John Calvin said, the master did not will outward discipline and ceremonies to prescribe in detail what we ought to do because he foresaw that this depended on the state of the times. And he did not deem one form suitable for all ages because he has taught nothing specifically. And of course, we know he has taught something specifically, right? Reading, preaching, singing, Lord's Supper, baptism. But apart from that is what Calvin means. Because he has taught nothing specifically and because these things are not necessary to salvation and because the upbuilding of the church ought to be variously accommodated to the customs of each nation and age, it will be fitting to change and abrogate traditional practices and to establish new ones. I admit that we ought not to charge into innovation rashly or for insufficient cause, But love will best judge what may hurt or edify. And if we let love be our guide, all will be safe. Let me pray, and then we'll take a 10-minute break. Father, we pray for wisdom to know best in days to come, and even next Sunday, tomorrow. How best to worship you in a way that glorifies you and edifies our saints. Help us, Lord, even this morning to lay aside our preferences, to lay aside ourselves, to listen to your word, to think through what you'd have us do and how we should think and how we approach you. There's nothing more important in the world than these things. For you are great and greatly to be praised. We pray for your help this morning in our praise. Grow us, we pray. Amen.